Um, yeah, so thank you. I love being here. Uh, I'm going to confess that you guys are going to be a little bit of guinea pigs this morning. So um, totally revamped the way that, you know, I taught machine learning last year at this event. And I think, you know, definitely leveraging some themes that you guys have already started working on, of course, and different tool sets. Um, but, but again, a little bit about me. Uh, I work at Eagle View. It's a company over on the uh, east side in Bellevue. Um, I've only been in the area for about a year now, so I'm new to, to Seattle region. Eagle View is an aerial imagery company, and I lead the team that does all of the machine learning feature extraction at scale. So a lot of cloud-based processing and cloud orchestration of machine learning workflows. Um, so, you know, what I feel like I, I'm really excited to share with you today is kind of a uh, chocolate sampler platter of a lot of the tools that I use. Um, Personally, I am not a, uh, I never went to school for machine learning. I am an astrophysicist by training and my PhD, um, and then got very much into applied machine learning through just work. Um, and so really what I, I wanna share with you is, you know, some of these applied techniques, because I think often in remote sensing, that's where the value is, not necessarily, you know, in the theory, if you love the theory, that's great, but it's not, it can be a barrier, I think, to a lot of people's mental um, uh, desire to, to jump into machine learning. Um, so, you know, just briefly, what is, um, why, why machine learning, first of all? I think what I really think is super valuable um, when it comes to machine learning and just kind of imagery analytics in this space that a lot of us are in, uh, is that machine learning and, and particularly supervised machine learning um, using convolutional neural networks, another buzzword, um, is really good at scaling pattern recognition. So doing things like land use mapping, um, extracting different types of features, whether it's you know, water bodies or, or tree canopies, there's a wealth of, of applications. Um, and so it, it's fairly easy to adopt this as a tool. So machine learning is just a tool to scale um, your remote sensing uh, needs. I'm going to probably break away a little bit from some of the discussions around Pangeo or use of Pangeo. And I decided that I just want you guys to use your laptops. Um, I'm going to caveat that, and I tested this on a Mac laptop and also on some Linux. So I would suggest, like, within your little teams of, uh, at the table that you're on, you know, work together. If somebody has a Mac, great. Um, obviously, we can troubleshoot as we go. But I want you to um, basically work as a data scientist that, like, my day-to-day, -day, how I expect my, my data scientist to work, will be creating a virtual environment in Python so it won't mess up your system or any of your other um, dependencies or libraries. <laughs> But this will also allow us to really manipulate the data pretty easily, uh, and then also visualize it with a bunch of other tools. So it just seemed to me to be a little bit of an overhead to expect all of that out of Pangeo. Also, I was a little behind on getting all that organized. Um, let's see, so, you know, kind of in the end, uh, everything that I'm gonna show you is not meant to scare you or, or give you stress or panic, but fundamentally, like, this is what I think of as like, having kick-ass data science skills. You know, there's an application of machine learning, there's some cloud tools that I'm gonna share with you. And so fundamentally, like everything in these notebooks, I would consider to be, you know, these major resume boosters. So that's, you know, just to give you a feel for that. Um, I guess the one thing I didn't mention, we'll be, we're gonna be using Amazon SageMaker, AWS SageMaker. I don't know, how many of you have ever used this tool? You know, okay, that's good. How about, how many of you have used anything in AWS from a cloud services perspective? Okay, so there's definitely quite a few people that, that are familiar with cloud services, um, but that's cool. AWS SageMaker is great. It kind of gives us this abstracted platform where we can basically spin up these machines in the cloud and not even worry about it. We don't have to log into anything um, from you know, a terminal and we don't have to spin up our own GPU machines. It's just kind of this nice abstracted way where we can control some compute environments and as part of that, uh, Amazon actually was really nice and for this event gave us some credits to do this. So you'll have this ability throughout this week to use the same system for testing out anything that you want to test out. Um, okay. So uh, I call this space GeoML, I think you can see this. Um, GeoML has like three main components. And so you probably at this point have already had the raster information and the vector information. Um, I'm tagging on this machine learning component. You know, raster is, of course, pixels, right? Um, it's RGB or other, you know, near infrared, uh, you know, shortwave infrared, et cetera. Any type of pixel data. Um, 
you know, some of the different tools that you probably talked about in terms of, uh, you know, Slippy Map, uh, GeoTIFFs, uh, using things like GDAL. Um, we're going to be touching on a couple of different project or libraries in this space. And so if you haven't seen it, that's okay, don't panic. Um, but again, I'm showing you some really valuable tools here. Uh, there's also, you know, on our first day when we were coming up with, uh, you know, drawing the vector data with uh, the missing map sky chase, um, you know, there was a lot of great questions around generating uh, you know, bounding boxes around buildings against different imagery sets and you see the shift and you see, you know, just there's a lot of uncertainty in what we call ortho registration of imagery. And so that, that uh, becomes a big factor when we're trying to create training data. And, and I think we'll see some more of that a little bit later. You know, on the vector side, uh, I think you guys have already been um, acquainted with OSMNX, which is the, the tool that allows you to interface with OSM data. Um, super nice. I know Chase mentioned Overpass Turbo, which can be a little complicated, but it's a great way to just like get the kind of data that you need globally. Um, but some of the other libraries I like, of course, are um, uh, GeoPandas, Shapely, um, you know, Ogre to Ogre, and then we're going to be using Tippy Canoe. I don't know, um, was there a discussion on MV tiles and, and Slippy Map tiles at all? Okay, that's cool. Um, so we'll get into that too in a little bit. Uh, but then on the machine learning side, so this is also like combining forces between the raster and the vector. So raster becomes kind of our, um, you know, our image set that we want to train for pattern recognition. The vector becomes the supervised labels that we're going to couple with the raster data. And then we're gonna supervise the machine learning algorithm to create a set of correlations without us dictating the rules of logic. So it's kind of the tool that brings it together. Um, in AWS, and particularly in SageMaker, the default is this a framework called MXNet. Um, you've probably heard of TensorFlow, there's Torch, um, a lot of other kind of frameworks. They all kind of do the same thing. It's just kind of programming in different languages. Uh, but, but again, we're gonna abstract from that actual framework and just show you how to use this tool. Um, okay, so. Okay, so I'm gonna have you guys clone this uh, GitHub repo. This is on my um, public space. Um, I, will, I can share this in the Slack as well. And we're gonna set up this virtual environment. We're gonna do a crash course in S3, EC2, kind of some console stuff. Um, we're gonna create some training data based on OSM. We're gonna check out that training data. Um, and then we're gonna, uh, I guess what I neglected to put in here, we're gonna create a model and then test an endpoint in the cloud. So you'll actually have an API service where you can submit new images from other satellite uh, uh, data sets down the line and hit that particular API that you set up and you'll have predictions. Um, okay, so that was just my, my brief little notes to myself that I wanted to make sure to remember to you. So I wanna, let me um, give you that link in Slack here. <clears throat> A second. Any questions so far while we're going through this? Just shout them out if something comes to your mind. So here's our GitHub repo. I just posted it in the general channel. So let me zoom into this guy because it's awesome. this somewhat. Um, again, this is all public, so you can, you can load it up online at GitHub and you can follow along that way as well. Um, all right, so let's see. So we're going to specifically be focusing on this uh, hot OSM data set um, that was developed through the Cyclone Kenneth that happened in April. Um, this is not, of course, the same location that you guys are working on on Monday, but it's very much similar. We're going to be pulling the buildings, um, the building footprints, and we're going to use that in combination with some Visual Globe, also called Maxar, um, imagery to create uh, a training data set. And there's two parts we're going to go through. Part one is strictly about creating the training data, um, and then part two is actually that model application. And so, you know, at any point, you know, if it starts to look like, you know, people are dragging or, or eyes are glazing over, we can kind of skip around. Um, but it's all here. You can come back to it. 
uh, and then, you know, what I want to emphasize too, I think once we open up one of these notebooks, I have a couple notes here. Um, this is meant to, again, give you a, an insight into some of the tools. It's not meant to, to stress you out or, or make you concerned that you don't have a background. It's all here. This is kind of, again, like my, the last five years of my knowledge base, trying to, to share that with you so that you have, um, you're well armed with um, kind of tools in your tool chest to use. All right, so the first thing that we're gonna do is create this virtual environment. We're going to use Python 3. Um, and it's pretty easy. I, I just have a, an example here. I can't for the life remember why I named my virtual environment SageMaker Trans, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, literally, at least in an, in a, on a Mac, you can just copy and in a terminal. Um, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to call it something else because I think I already have one going on. Uh, oops. Did I miss something? Oh, it's an X, yeah. So it's pretty quick. It's gonna download some basic tools, um, obviously some basic Python packages. We're good to go. Um, I hope you guys can read that. Let's see, all right. So then now we're gonna source this guy that we just created. Um, I know I just renamed it, so I didn't overwrite what I had. So I think I called them three. And then um, bin activate. All right, boom. So now we know we're in our environment, right? Because we have like this little um, guy in parentheses here, the name of our environment. So we're kind of in this safe space, what I like to think. We can install libraries, um, especially if there's conflicts with things that you've already installed on your system, you know, with Python, it, it, it should keep it compartmentalized. I am very bad about using virtual environments, but I highly recommend it for projects. Because then you can just kill it, you know, clean it up, done, and not worry about it again. Um, all right, so we're gonna uh, CD into this, it makes this little directory here. Um, and we see that we have a bin and include in a loop. Okay, so it's kind of like being in a virtual machine and now at this point. Okay, so step one, pretty easy. Um, step two, we're gonna clone this repo. So again, just copy. Oh, you need more time? You want me to slow down? <laughs> okay, no worries, no worries. Yeah, I think uh, it may have taken that for granted how long it takes. Um, yeah, so uh, any questions other than that so far? Give me a thumbs up when you're like ready to keep going. <clears throat> yeah. Awesome, how Sorry, it's a little hard to hear you. Oh, oh, do you, you have a virtual environment on your machine? No. Um, you might be able to keep it. Yeah, it's definitely easier. Yeah. Also, I just uh, put a message on the Slack channel. People are running this on the hub instead of their virtual machine. You can install virtual and Oh. And then go from there. So there's like a note on Slack. Awesome, thank you. Oh, perfect. All right, do we have some people that succeeded with the virtual environment? Okay, see some hands, give another couple minutes. I think once you do this once, it'll be fast going in the future. Um, but I, again, this is something that's super valuable. I, I think um, obviously you know, useful in the hub, of course, but then um, useful on your own machine as you develop some of your different uh, libraries and capabilities. So I'm gonna go ahead and, and just keep going. Um, but, but again, feel free to go back at your own pace and catch up here. Um, we're just gonna clone this. And so you guys are super familiar now with, with GitHub, I, I'm assuming. Um, so we're just gonna clone this repo. And I definitely wanna encourage you guys, you know, this is totally public, uh, you know, branch it. Use your skills to like check it out, branch it, you know, make modifications, send me comments, you know, use this as a safe space if you want to test out your public <coughs> GitHub capabilities. Um, that's totally cool. Um, we can even go through the whole pull request thing at some later point if you wanna test that out. 
All right, so it was pretty quick for me to clone. Um, now if we look in the directory, we have this Sagely, uh, which is just our, our repo. So I'm just gonna go into that guy. <clears throat> All right, so I tried to make this pretty easy. Um, you'll see, bigger here. Um, you should see kind of all the core pieces of that GitHub repo in there. And I tried to kind of hide a bunch of things that were, um, you know, maybe overly complicated. You know, you're welcome to go into the scripts at any point and look at what some of the tools are doing. Uh, but, but again, I wanted to keep it a little bit streamlined. Um, so I've, I've created basically three uh, bash scripts. Uh, one is called setup. One is called get data, and then one that you'll use later is called test. So the setup is gonna basically get you all of the pip libraries that you need. I guess I just fell short on the virtual environment, so hopefully we, we got some of that ironed out. Um, but if we just wanna check out the setup.sh real quick, um, we can actually just click on it here and look at it. So you can see um, there's quite a few different libraries. Some of them you might be familiar with, some of them you might not. Um, there was an interesting, some interesting dependencies where I had to use a, a previous version of OSMNX in order to be compatible with Sage Maker. So again, this is something that's super useful um, to have that virtual environment in case you have a totally different um, version of OSMNX you don't want to mess with or, or have a create conflicts around. Um, but some of the basic ones here, GeoPandas, um, which is going to allow us to manipulate the, the geo data frames that we create. Of course, Jupyter, because it's a virtual, virtual environment, it doesn't have um, Jupyter notebooks on it. Um, we're gonna use AWS CLI, which is the command line interface to AWS, uh, really basically. Um, but again, I encourage all of you to go back and, and look up at some of the capabilities of this. Uh, we'll plot some stuff. Um, Folium is a really cool library that I just kind of discovered recently. Um, it integrates with Jupyter Notebook, and you can visualize uh, basically web maps and put vector data and master data on it if you want to as well. Um, OpenCV for some of our pre-processing. PaperMill is a cool one that I'll show you soon um, that allows you to run or basically execute a IPython notebook um, by passing variables. So it's really nice in the case of you have sensitive information like passwords or, or various other things you don't want checked into GitHub, um, you, can, you can use that. And the other big one is Supermercado, which is uh, when we start talking about slippy tiles, slippy maps, um, it's allowing us to go and basically get the type of information from a geospatial perspective, uh, basically going to the supermarket, <laughs> to get uh, uh, kind of the, the data structures that we need. So that'll become more obvious. All right, so we're just gonna run, um, just based again on, let me go back to this guy. <clears throat> so we're gonna, run uh, just our setup. So sh setup.sh should work. Um, so it, it takes a couple minutes here, especially um, again, if you haven't installed some of these before and if there's other dependencies, but I think it should be pretty consistent for everyone. I don't see any crazy warnings or issues coming up so far. Um, yeah, let's go ahead and have that run. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Have we been able to install virtual environment and, or get on the hub? We're good. Okay. Some nods. Another minute or so, it should be done. <clears throat> I think once we get to the actual training, um, you'll you'll. That's where we definitely want to kind of maximize the use of the team space. So kind of, you know, uh, training models kind of as a team at your table, um, just because it can get a little crazy. So I will definitely um, give you a heads up there. Let's see, it's getting there. Um, once that finishes, we'll go ahead and let's talk about the, the data side. So again, how I like to structure GitHub repos is to like have these bash scripts is super useful to get all the necessary data, um, supplemental files, et cetera. It's really cool. Um, the, the git data, wherever it is here, git data.sh is pretty simple. Um, I've created a public bucket, um, public S3 bucket. So if you're not familiar, so kind of the core AWS words that I'm gonna use, S3 is uh, just where files get stored. It's just kind of a data archive, if you think of it that way. Um, 
think it's simple storage service, S3. Uh, and so I'm gonna, and the public buckets that I've created here have kind of this pre-baked cake of data. Uh, you know, I will show you exactly how to create this exact same data, but I wanted to make sure we had some stuff in in case we ran out of time um, or you wanted to go back and play around with some things. Um, so we're going to just be grabbing some data sets that become more obvious in a second, um, but that's that's strictly what it's doing. So hopefully it's happy. So we'll get, we're just going to run it this, this exact same way. Um, sh get data.sh. And you see it's pulling down. Um, individual image tiles. So these individual tiles are actually chunked out pieces of a raster image, which I'll show you in a second. And then it's also going to grab um, some annotations, some various other things that, that I will definitely um, give some more information about in a second too. <clears throat> so we'll let that run in the background. And then we're just about there. I think that was kind of, we got our data, um, we set up our environment. Now, as soon as that's done, we are going to be ready to run our notebook. So mine just finished. Um, everybody else, were you able to get to the data? Uh, no? Having a little bit of yeah. 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 Oh, it's still stuck on the <laughs> Looks like there might still be some libraries that are installing, so no worries if that's the case. Um, you guys, anybody over here stuck on installing things? So, does it look like it's doing stuff, or is it? Ooh, that's encouraging. <laughs> oh, that's the same one. I think. Um, yeah, it's just. But feel free to share. You know, I look, it looks like some people have the data. Yeah, it's a little unreliable because we're all dealing. I mean, again, this is probably the benefit of using uh, a hub, of course, because we're all in the same environment. Um, but it just would definitely be a bit of a, a insanity to, to find out everybody doing something. So, same thing. Anybody here have the data yet? Oh, I don't know what you have. Oh, okay. Oh, you're already like you're already started your notes. Python notebook and upload it directly from
So let's just, I want to keep this rolling because again, we, we only have about an hour left. Um, so don't get too panicked if you get stuck. Um, this is definitely something that you can work through um, at your own pace. So I don't, I don't want to um, concern anybody there. And I'll be around afterwards to, to walk through about you know, some specific bugs. All right, because I'm not in the hub, I'm going to just go ahead and start this notebook server. I actually already have it running, so I think I'm not going to, to make this command line call. But if you're on your terminal um, and you haven't started it, you want to go ahead and, and start this notebook server. Again, in the hub, you're already in a server, so you don't need to do this piece. So let me go to, um, this is part one, the part one notebook. So once you, uh, if you started the, the, if you started your own server, um, you should basically, a, a, a website, you know, just pops up, kind of a, a local host, and it shows you exactly the contents that you have from the GitHub repo. So this is why I was saying, if you're on the Pangeo server, you can just uh, download, you know, or, or just upload that IPython notebook. So there's this training part one and training part two. You can pull those in directly, and then they should be mostly operational for you. Um, all right. So we're going to actually, I, a little green guy here, I'm already active on this. So I'm going to go ahead and, and come over here. So this is my training part one. And so I, I wrote a lot of things here. This is, again, I'm, as a data scientist, I'm really bad about documenting things. But I tried very hard for this particular application to document a lot of stuff. Um, we already talked a lot about these things kind of, um, uh, just kind of the basics, you know, talking about geo machine learning. Um, one of the things, so what we're going to really do today, again, is because we're going to get this vector data, which are buildings. These are, these are objects. We want to identify objects in an image frame. So they're going to have not only just pixel coordinates, but they're going to have geo coordinates. So that's why we're going to be using things like geo pandas. We can create geo JSONs. Um, so it'll become more obvious. But these are objects. We're not just categorizing images and I'll, I'll show you an example of that too in a sec so we already talked about this um, so again I want to reemphasize this a lot because I think it's a lot of material but I think it's also super valuable so I'm not trying to scare you um, but again work through at your own pace and and hopefully we can get through some of this as, as my um, voluntary guinea pigs in the audience this morning so just to give you kind of a, a picture of what it is we're doing, you know, so on a machine learning side, specifically, uh, when I talk about machine learning, I use it in this very, you know, supervised machine learning convolutional neural network application. And really when it comes to geospatial applications, there's kind of three core mappings of the types of convolutional neural networks that are typically used. So there's this idea of classification. So you have an image of something and you want to just label it, right? Um, and then there's this classification and localization or object detection, which is you want to draw a box around it, right? And so again, those boxes will have pixel coordinates, they'll have, they could have geo coordinates. Um, and then kind of going a step further is instant segmentation. So that's where you want to know the precise pixels that encapture whatever you're interested in in that scene. And so that's where, you know, going towards, kind of if we go to the bottom now, backwards, instant segmentation, is something like land use or land classification. So in the picture below the, the dog and kitty pictures, we have this trees, irrigated lawn, man-made pool, non-irrigated color scheme, which is all generated against a raster image um, using machine learning. So using exactly the techniques that we're gonna talk about today. And then stepping uh, back towards the left, um, that object detection equivalent in geospatial is something like detect all the buildings or detect all the cars, right? Um, and then that, that classification, which is kind of the easiest one, is, uh, is this a roof? Um, and so, you know, my data scientists, what they typically do is there might be a, a higher level um, set of information, like not just a roof, but like, is it a roof in good condition? Or is it a tiled roof? So there's kind of these different gradations you can start asking about um, data. How are we doing so far? Good? <clears throat> okay. So now we're going to get back into this world of Cyclone Kenneth. Um, you know, I picked this one uh, because at the time when I first started working on this, you know, it was, it was a recent event. Um, it's now a little um, outdated, but I think honestly this task is still open, so you can definitely still contribute to it. It also turned out that there was some really good raster data that I could use. Um, so uh, if you just kind of, there's a, a nice little wiki page put up by Hot OSM about some of the details around this Cyclone Kenneth. And in particular, um, a little bit bigger, maybe. 
uh, I think there are some, uh, they also create in the wiki some specifics around what tasks are open at the time. So this might have changed, it's pretty updated, but it gives you a sense going back to what we learned on Monday, you know, contributing to specific tasks. And so you can kind of also see the priority that people were looking for. And a lot of this was related to mapping buildings. Um, largely, you can imagine that you know, knowing where structures are gives first responders the ability to go evacuate people or repair or you know, whatever the case is. So that, that's really valuable. And of course, in many of these locations, especially with this humanitarian open street map team tasks, um, they tend to be third world countries or countries that are under um, uh, uh, established in terms of infrastructure, right? So they, they need, there's a big need. So, you know, OSM is gonna again be our vector data set that we're going to use for labels. We're gonna get those buildings that are already contributed here. For raster, we're gonna be using, this is a super irritating um, green, sorry, I didn't realize that was in everybody's. <clears throat> green line in here. Um, we're gonna be using the Digital Globe uh, open data. Digital Globe is just bought out by Maxar, so you might see that word uh, interchangeably used. Um, but this open data, I provided a link here you can get raster imagery for predominantly almost every international um, uh, uh, weather event or catastrophe. Uh, the problem with it's a very challenging archive to search through in terms of, you know, it's kind of just a dump of images. Um, you don't really get a geospatial context of where exactly that, that location is until you download it. Um, and so they're pretty big, they're satellite files, right? So many gigabytes potentially. Um, and there's a little bit of a cheat I'm gonna show you uh, later to help with that. So this was, again, pre-baked. I went and I found an, an image that I felt overlapped where some of these buildings were. But now we're gonna jump into um, you know, this OSMNX, which I think is something that, that you guys are now more familiar with. So uh, we're just going to, let's see, I'm gonna go ahead and start running this. And hopefully, um, Hopefully things are working for you guys. But again, I can, I can circle around during some dead time to, to help troubleshoot. Um, this takes a little bit of time because it is actually going um, and it's searching using OSMNX for all of the, the geo information that I need um, for this particular location. Um, so it's grabbing that graph um, and it's getting, you know, again, apparently all the road networks, all the buildings, anything else anybody's checked in. So we're creating this graph of data um, and we're gonna go ahead and read it in. And so it definitely looks like this. So you can see again, you see the road networks, the little blue things I think are building areas. Um, a little hard to zoom in here, but you get the idea. We have data, we're able to visualize it somewhat. Um, I don't know to what degree you guys talked about this the other day, but this is called a digraph, which I wasn't super familiar with this term, um, but it basically provides all those features in the database that we just queried against. But really, you know, we're just interested in the footprints themselves. Um, and this is one minor change. Um, so in current OSMNX, uh, uh, the current OSMNX library, it uses this notion of footprints from place. We really, I think because of the incompatibility I talked about earlier, I had to use an earlier version. So I think it's actually buildings, but one or the other should work. Um, and then apparently not buildings, so I was right. didn't barf yet, so, so far so good. It takes a little bit of time, of course, because it's gonna grab a ton of buildings. Um, and I should note that the buildings themselves, like, you know, we drew, uh, on Monday, we, we tended to draw boxes around buildings. Um, you don't really know what you're getting in OSM data. They could be boxes, they could be polygons, where they're not just rectangles, but maybe more, you know, an, a shape of, an organic, more organic shape of a building. Um, they could also be circles, of course, like if you have kind of circular huts or anything like that. So you're getting a variety of shapes. But it looks like it worked. So we have our geo, geo data frame of the areas and the buildings. Um, we're going to go ahead and visualize some of this. This might also take a second or two to just um, play. <clears throat> you're getting some errors? Did you try the buildings from places? Yeah, it might be. Yeah, it just it kind of unfortunately depends on which fiber it's installed. I thought I had it ironed out, but it might still be a game. Buildings plural. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 
That's, I might have to come back to that one. That's a new one for me. If anybody's seen the kind of the, if you're seeing the error with the OSMNX having problems with lip spatial, that might be some additional incompatibility. Sure, but we can put it aside and work on it. Kernel error might be the, if you run this on your local. There's too much data that it's trying to shove into memory. <laughs> um, so that is something that I didn't anticipate either. So we might have to work through that a little bit. Um, we can maybe cut that down and not return all the data. So uh, we can talk about that Sorry. <laughs> so yeah, if you're running into a kernel error, the question was um, you that might be a result of the amount of data that's returned. Um, and I'll just show you. So just just bear with me. We'll walk through this um, and then we can revisit that afterwards. Um, you know, the buildings that hopefully for some of you it returned, and I would encourage like if you're able, if, if it's working for you, definitely turn to your neighbors and um, share some of this if you, you have some lessons learned. But some of the features that you get back, um, of course, this, I'm just looking at one entry. So I get the polygon, the information. Um, I get that it's a building, I get the source. So it was generated off of being imagery. And then you get a bunch of other stuff that's not really built in. Um, and then I'm gonna go ahead and run this. But you can see, you know, part of the reason why you might be running into a kernel error is because it's storing information for almost 36,000 buildings. Um, so if you are getting that kernel error, I think it's just because of the memory that it's requiring to store that. So that's something that we can cut down um, later. Or it can also provide this data as an aside. You, the good thing is, is like to run the model, uh, we actually have all that data already on that I had you guys download earlier, so you should still be able to do that. So. Um, all right, so you know we're gonna, like I said before, we're gonna grab that um, digital globe information, that digital globe imagery as well. And I saved you guys a lot of headache of trying to figure out wh what image to pull. Um, but the thing is, because we're gonna create something called an object detector, uh, we one of the easiest formats to use uh, in object detection for machine learning, especially single shot detection, is this something that's called the VOC Pascal training data set. And so this is just um, kind of one of those slightly antiquated formats that people have kind of used throughout the years. It's going to require us to basically create a folder of image chips and a folder of annotations. Um, and so it's a one for one. So for each image in the, the image, and you'll see in a second the JPEG images, there's going to be um, an annotation set. And so um, you can think of each of the little images will be a tile chunk. Uh, so just a 256 by 256 piece of that raster. And then the corresponding annotation is gonna be an XML file that just has where those buildings were um, that we're downloading. So just to give you a little bit of context there. I created some links here that you can of course go back to at your own um, time and, and look through. And I think I already got off my platform on kind of the complications of looking through the Digital Globe Open Data. It's a great resource but it's a little challenging to search through. So one of the sidebar things I'm not gonna run because it, it'll take a little bit, um, uh, take a little while, is that there's this idea of uh, cloud optimized GeoTIFF. And this is something where you can basically virtually stream just chunks of that large GeoTIFF from um, open data, uh, and, but not download the entire thing. So this is something that uh, I have found to be pretty useful. Um, and you can actually create, if you're familiar with a virtual raster, you can create this, it's basically a wrapper around streaming information from the web. Um, and you can create this very lightweight raster data set, and then you can open it pretty easily with QGIS or something as well. So I just wanted to share that with you um, if you come into this place. And it's pretty simple. Um, you know, basically you can use GDAL uh, to build a virtual raster. So GDAL build vert. Um, you know, I just named it something stupid. Um, and then you kind of attach this little prepend with the link the full link to the image. So in this case, I grabbed this particular image after a lot of painful trying to find images that were useful. Um, and then I just created this, I used this VSI curl command to create this very lightweight small foo.vert, which can be loaded geospatially. So that's just one way. And then you can convert that vert file. Once you're happy with it, you can convert it into a regular TIFF. So it's a way to just kind of subsample out the information if you don't want to download that full data set. All right. So just kind of moving on, um, 
<clears throat> so what we're going to do is now going back to this idea of slippy map tiles. And again, I feel like I'm just shoving a shit ton of information at you. So please, you know, use what you will, absorb what you can. It's a lot to shove into this hour and a half. Um, but what I love about MB tiles, this is a standard raster format, um, not unlike a TIFF, except it was kind of designed for web-based digital map um, streaming. So think of Google Maps um, or anything else that's kind of loading. If you kind of visualize in your mind too, like if you click on Google Maps and you say load satellite, it kind of loads in this very tile format, these chunks of little squares that are loading. Um, those are called slippy map tiles. And basically, I gave this link here. We can click it just to give you an idea. This is like one of the best things that I've used over many, many years um, that gives you a definition and an easy way to kind of zoom in and out uh, to get an idea for, for what I'm talking about. So this whole little checkerboard pattern, these are slippy map tiles. And so everywhere in the world um, can be, you know, just has a slippy tile format um, that you can, you know, use just like you would use any kind of geo-coordinates. So one thing that you notice is that they're always structured in this X, Y, Z format. So it's, you know, kind of X and Y are your 2D spatial, and Z is your zoom level or your resolution. So zoom one is like this global view. Um, and as you start zooming in, it might take a little while to change here, you start seeing um, kind of an adaptation of the zoom level. That's a little slow. So we're at zoom nine. Um, and, but again, we get these unique coordinates. So it's just a way to digital, digitally sample a raster and display it easily on the web. But the beautiful thing for machine learning is it gives us these little packets of images that we can easily train and distribute across a cloud-based system. So rather than looking at a gigantic, you know, five gigabyte raster image, we can have these little tiled chips. We know exactly where, they're, where they are because we have kind of the coordinate indices that you'll see in a second. Um, and then we can use them to really easily scale a machine learning model that can be applied across a really large area. Um, okay, so going back. <clears throat> um, so I, this is something that I've already run to. You downloaded this file. So this is kind of, I did a little bit of this hard work for you where uh, I created an MB tiles for you, just if you wanted to see um, I created that a TIFF from the virtual raster that I downloaded earlier. Um, you'll just have to trust me there. And then I used GDAL Translate to just turn it into an MB tile file. And so now what happens is it actually creates, um, I use this MB util, uh, which I'm just realizing I might not have put in the setup. Um, so it may or may not run for you, but that's also just another pip install. I'll have to correct that. Um, and it creates this tiles directory. So now we have this tiles directory that has the zoom level. So in this case, Digital Globe, this is World View 3. It's the zoom levels correspond to specific resolutions. So um, 0.3 centimeter or 0.3 uh, meters per pixel corresponds to a zoom level of 19. So if you go, um, let's see, we go here. And I think I already have the tiles downloaded because I also included that in your, your data download in case anything went wrong. So if we just do an LS and we look at the tile structure, we see um, these are all the X coordinates. Um, so like I said, X, Y, and Z. So, it, so the way that it's structured uh, is Z, in this case 19, X. And then if we go a little bit further and just open one of these guys, to see that they're PNGs. So if you, you can open one of these on your own computer, and these are just regular PNGs, and they're a little 256 by 256 chip of the raster that I created for you guys. So again, these nice little compartmentalized chunks of, of raster information. <clears throat> All right, so now I hid a bunch of stuff under the rug, and you can definitely go back and look at it. I created a bunch of helper functions that um, really just take uh, a lot of the tiles and um, allow us to, to start extracting some, some more information out of them. So the first thing that I did um, is that, you know, we have, we have buildings, so we created this geo data frame uh, structure previously. So we have a buildings data frame that's just a bunch of the buildings that, that we're interested in using as training data. And I wanna create, um, I wanna make sure that I get a data frame out of that, I guess at this point it's, a, it's that graph, that OSM and X graph. So we're going to convert it into a data frame. And so that's all that this particular function is doing. Um, if we run that, it might take a little bit of time. Not too bad. <clears throat> Oops. Okay. 
Um, and you can see in this data frame, we kind of simplified a lot of things. We took out a bunch of the other crap that wasn't populated in the OSMNX data dump. And now we're just left with a geometry and class. So, you know, you can, I would encourage you to go back and look at some of those helper functions. Um, but this is what that we're gonna now take and actually visualize. So this is that folium um, that uh, I had alluded to previously. It allows us in this Jupyter Hub to be able to visualize this, this slippy map. And it also allows us to put these uh, data frame, these little geodata buildings on a map. So um, in this particular case, I am using uh, a Mapbox account. You can sign up for a Mapbox Studio account. You can get a token, a developer's token. Um, this is really cool. It allows you to create maps. I definitely highly recommend you guys looking at it at some point. Um, but just in the interest of time, um, we'll just get it running. And the, the beautiful thing here is you can see, this is just a sample, again, because of kind of the, the amount of buildings we saw, 36,000 or something. I just wanted to look at a couple thousand. So you can kind of see where we are in the world. We're on the Camorra Islands there. Um, the little blue guys are all of the buildings that we've downloaded, um, just a small sample of them. So, it, you know, it's not complete. And then this raster actually works out pretty well in that the base map here being pulled is a digital globe image. So it's very similar to the type of raster data that we have. Um, but you can see, you know, as you guys had experience with on Monday, you know, what is a building? Your mind starts kind of going a little bit crazy with, you know, you think things are buildings, um, but you're not 100% sure. And that's where that kind of uncertainty comes into play. And that's why, you know, that was what we emphasized on Monday, where as a data scientist, it's really important that you spend a lot of time looking at your data to kind of start training yourself in terms of how, what are the complications? How long is this gonna take? Where, you know, if you as a human can't figure out what a building is, then the algorithm is also not magically gonna figure that out either. So it really gives you some insight into what to expect. Um, so I, you know, it's, it's a nice thing to visualize and have, uh, you know, as a resource. All right, so, you know, what we need to do now is, so we have these really beautiful little buildings. Um, we need to figure out, like I mentioned before, we have this tile grid, these MB tiles, you know, these XYZ locations around the globe, and we just need to figure out which XYZ goes to which, uh, which of these little rectangles. And so that's where the Supermercado comes in. Um, again, this is something that I have in the background, and I'm not going to go into to detail too much, but that it now, you know, basically this function is just going to map each one of those boxes to that XYZ tile format. And so if you just take my um, uh, word for it, if you open, uh, I, the byproduct is also I create a GeoJSON. You can look at some of the GeoJSONs in the GitHub. Uh, but if you load it up, you can actually see now, rather than just buildings, we also get these little gridded coordinates, um, little gridded chips, which are corresponding to those XYZ locations. And if we kind of just overlay the buildings, like I showed you above, the little blue guys are the buildings, the brown areas are all of the individual tile grids that we need to cover for training data purposes um, to, to make this system work. Any questions so far? I'm sure there's like a billion questions. <clears throat> all right, so we got labels, we have imagery, you know, we're making progress. And this is, of course, this is 90% of the life of a data scientist, right? I, I'm pretty sure you guys didn't bet on jumping into this this early in the morning. Um, I think you are probably hoping there's some beautiful magical unicorn machine learning, but, but really the machine learning part, as you'll see, is kind of the more simple part. It's really this data aggregation that is complicated, especially with the geospatial side. But we're using this, you know, to train our, our object detector to pull out buildings. We're going to use this Pascal VOC style data structure. And this is all that that means. Like I said before, there's a set of images. Our images are going to be those little image chips that we um, that I showed you, uh, the PNGs or JPEGs in this case. Um, the annotations, uh, we've actually, I, like I had earlier, or I think it's coming up a little bit, um, we're taking these buildings and we're creating little XML files that are also mapped to these XYZs. And so there's gonna be kind of a one-for-one -one relationship with these two. And then this image sets just has a set of text files that tell us what percentage of data we wanna use to train our model and what percentage we wanna use for validation. Um, so a couple things that I, I didn't want to run to because, you know, I didn't want to overwrite anything that we had going on, but there's some helper functions here. So this is um, basically taking our, our slippy map uh, building information with all their locations and actually creating the annotations. Um, and then it's doing something where it's flattening um, just to get it ready. So there's just some more pre-processing getting ready for training the, the neural network. 
Um, but at the end of the day, uh, hopefully we have an equal amount of VOC annotations, these XML files, and VOC JPEGs. And I can show you um, kind of briefly what an annotation file looks like. <clears throat> so if we just go into our VOC uh, directory and then we go into annotations, um, you see all these little XML files. Um, and if we just grab one of these guys, A lot of you know kind of nonsensical uh, slightly gibberish things but you might notice some tags like bounding box um, which is an object and you can see kind of their x and y positions so x min or x max y max x min y min are defining the extensions of the bounding box of the building um, and then there might be more than one building in this particular annotation so this this one annotation for this particular file will correspond to one of the image chips um, any questions so far? Okay, we're almost to the end of this, and I swear we'll take maybe a, a little bit of a break for you guys to stretch your legs. I know it's been kind of a long haul. Um, so we have our raw data uh, to train SageMaker, but also often to train TensorFlow or Torch. Sometimes we want to put all of this raw data into an optimized kind of binary file that's just it's more efficient for the various frameworks and so the last couple of steps here um, are just to basically take these raw images uh, take the raw annotations and create an optimized um, data set that we're going to then dump into aws and so in particular um, there's just a couple of things here where um, you know i'm creating that that train list and the val list uh, and you know they're going to be pretty small data sets. I, I wound up not curating a lot for you to test out, but um, I'll show you an example um, soon, and that'll be more uh, useful. But really, you know, just kind of going through here, getting the data a little bit organized, and then there's a couple of helper functions in this repo that creates these rec files. So there's going to be a training rec, which will be your training data. It's going to be some large percentage of the data of the, the buildings that we downloaded and their imagery. And then we have to do almost the exact same thing for a validation set. Um, so we create, at the end of the day, these two files, validation.rec and train.rec. Um, and so, you know, with machine learning, you know, basically what we're trying to do is we have, you know, a, a set of, as we'll get into in a second, a set of neurons, which are just mathematical functions with weights. Um, we are feeding in the, we're supervising kind of the development of correlations across those different algorithms with the information that we're feeding it from the training data perspective, but we don't know if we're getting any better or getting close to developing a set of correlations um, until we validate. So kind of one of the important things of machine learning, of course, is to have these very clear delineations between a training data set and a validation data set. And they both represent data from that initial um, uh, you know, data poll that you might be interested in, but they're very independent and very unique so that they can be you know, kind of an unbiased perspective. All right, so we've made it to the first notebook. And again, I know it's a lot and I feel like some eyes are glazing over. So what I would suggest is maybe, you know, just you know, stand up, walk around, talk to your neighbor. Um, let's give it maybe just like five minutes and come back. Um, the, the next notebook is really short, but it's kind of the meat of the, the machine learning stuff, but I wanna make sure you guys have a chance to like shake stuff off, okay? Hi. And I can answer questions while we take a little five minute breather. Environment. Okay. So I created, um, I'm working on creating a Docker. Oh, nice. 
Yes. So I got my day Oh, oh, that's awesome. Yes, absolutely. Um, of course, then the roadblock is more people. Yeah, that's okay. But, but people know, who use Docker might be helpful. So yeah. No, oh, that's awesome. I love it. Let me know. Absolutely. Any, um, I don't know. I'll probably help with photo lines or something. I love it. Thank you.
All right, so let's go ahead and finish this up. I think hopefully you guys got a little bit of a breather. Um, I think I see some really good progress around. I know that a couple of you are stuck on things and that's okay. I think this again is really representative of a data scientist's life. Um, but I did just wanna show you, you know, we created, the, the last thing we ended on is we created a bunch of training data sets in this DOC Pascal style. Um, I mentioned this in the Jupyter uh, notebook, but you can use uh, something like, there's this app called Rect Label, which is what I have here. You can get it on the App Store. There's also Label IMG, which is totally free. You can just download it from GitHub. Um, but it is expecting this VOC style format. So it's really nice in that you can just open up this data and visualize it. You don't need to write anything in Python or whatever. So I just wanted to show you some of the data and just give a, an example or just have a chance to talk about some of the caveats with OSM data. Um, this particular image this is exactly what we created. So we have this kind of slightly blurry 0.3 meter um, or uh, 0.3 meter per pixel uh, digital globe image underneath. So the raster data set. And those little green uh, areas are the buildings that we just spent a lot of time pulling from OSM, creating data frames, and et cetera. Um, and you can see, like, I'm even looking at this right now, and I'm like, I don't know. Did it miss some buildings? Could be. Not sure. I have a full expectation that this model is not going to be very good, right? Because there's going to be data that there's some uncertainties, and it's going to probably take some iteration. Um, this was a good one. So I just want, I had this kind of preloaded and ready to go so that I could also share with you um, a bad one. So um, this is a bad one. <laughs> so again, you're pulling down boxes that are created based on different imagery sets, not necessarily tied to this image set. So there could be errors in the way that it's annotated. Um, it could be potentially pulling the wrong vector information. Just, you know, it's, it's a crowdsourced data set, right? We can't just kind of blindly trust it. Um, and so part of that, you know, I didn't want to have you create all this training data and just blindly create a model based on that. So the data that we pulled and that, if you remember that git data.sh, that is kind of a curated data set, those rec files, um, so that they're, they're really small because I didn't spend a lot of time curating, but I went through and kind of curated some so that you had a good data set to start with. But this again is life in a data scientist world where you would probably spend a significant amount of time adjusting these annotations or throwing things out that were just beyond repair. Um, so I just wanted to talk about that because that is definitely uh, something that comes up with using any type of label data, um, especially those generated from data sources you have no control over. So kind of uh, jumping gears, and we only have about 20, 25 minutes left. So now we finally get to the meat of actually training the, the model. And you know, previously last year, I was a little hesitant, of course, to make it this far into in talking about um, uh, training a neural network or, or developing the data set for it because like you just saw, there's a huge amount of overhead. And I know it might've been painful for some of you and I apologize for some of the errors and stuff that you're getting, but, but that's just kind of, you know, it's a little messy. And so it's a lot to shove in, but I think there's still like a, a lot of utility there for you guys to be exposed to. Um, so in this one, uh, you know, we're going to actually be using uh, AWS, like I mentioned before. Um, the data that we have is going to be stuck on uh, AWS Cloud. And then we're going to train the SageMaker service uh, to create a model, spin up some resources, and produce a model output for us. Um, and so super simplified, because again, this is not a talk on the theoretical side of machine learning or neural networks. Um, I think what I mentioned before is, you know, we have a bunch of neurons in this neural network um, that are just simple, like fundamentally simple mathematical functions, and they have weights associated with them. And really, we, you know, our whole goal in training a neural network is we want to optimize what the weights are. So they're going to start relatively random unless we have some kind of prior knowledge. And this whole process of iterating and, and training, so we typically, you know, it's a statistical process where we're going to 
train this model, do something called a forward pass to try to update these weights and gain some knowledge based on how the different um, neurons are, are behaving. Uh, but we're gonna do this a bunch of times and we're, you know, every time that we go through this process, we're gonna check how well this model that's being generated, how well it performs against the validation data that I talked about earlier. Um, but, but to just take a step back, the kind of the number of neurons or the number of algorithms that you, the mathematical functions that you use and how they're related to each other is what defines a neural network architecture. So you might hear that word. Um, there's lots of different architectures. You know, we are using something in SageMaker that's a single shot detector, um, which has a very specific architecture. But there's also a very similar type of framework um, called RCNN, which does a similar thing, but has a slightly different architecture. Um, so just to, to use some of those buzzwords. But again, the goal is at the end of the day, we wanna both get a good score against our known truth data, which is our validation data, and we're minimizing this loss function, the statistical loss function as we iterate over time. Um, so that's, that's kind of in a nutshell. I think, uh, I think either tomorrow or maybe Friday morning, there was going to be some um, uh, mathematical statistic statisticians who might come in and talk a little bit more about the theory if you're interested as an option. Um, but this is, I think, from a functional perspective, you know, just the, the idea behind it. Um, so one thing that we're going to do, I mentioned this earlier, we're going to use, you might notice this, this notebook here that I have saved has these really interesting variables where there's these tags. Um, and, you know, we can run this notebook and pass a data to it that is sensitive, maybe we don't want to archive in this data. So I really like this. It, this library is called Papermill. Um, so we're actually going to, to create a little helper script here in a second that is um, uh, uh, allowing us to pass in some details. Okay, so for this guy, um, we're gonna now import SageMaker and it's nice that there's just a little Python library. Um, again, it kind of abstracts it and makes it a little bit more simple. I guess one thing that I should also mention um, Go back up here, just to get you used to using the AWS command line. Um, I'm going to give the entire population in this room a secret key and an access key to this particular AWS account. And so this is where you know we we probably don't want a hundred different models spun up at the same time. Um, we do kind of have a limited fund, so I would ask that you designate somebody in your team at your table to be the one to spin up the model, but you're welcome to use these keys to look at the data uh, and play around with the, the environment and stuff. So just, just setting a warning. So, um, so let me go ahead and I'm gonna slack you these, these keys so you're gonna have these. This is the, your foray now into um, the world of AWS. So I set these up just for you. We go to general, let's see, AWS data. So you'll see um, there's gonna be a very specific role that's gonna allow you to execute a SageMaker event. Um, and so it's a really kind of bizarre string, numeric string um, situation. The access, key, the access key allows you access to this AWS environment, and then the secret access key is, is part of that as well. But you can configure this. This is where that AWS command line thing works. Again, if you can't get this working, don't panic. I'm just sharing this with you. Um, but in our environment, we have already set up, uh, we had installed AWS CLI. So we can do something like AWS configure. And I'm gonna just make a special profile just for this particular account. So it's AWS configure dash dash profile UW. Um, and I already kind of had this preceded, but uh, there's an AWS access key, and that's where you would copy and paste um, the access key that I gave you. That's the exact same one that I just have there. Um, and then that secret access key. And then the region is US East too, and it does matter. Um, so that's all you need to do. The default output format is none, and you are good to go. And so just from the command line, if you do AWS S3 LS, um, I have to make sure to tell it we want to use this UW profile we just created. Hopefully, we see a data bucket. We have one and only one data bucket on this particular account, and it's named EcoView Data um, for no particular reason. But this is the bucket that we are going to send SageMaker to to grab data from to create the model, but then it's also going to be where the outputs um, wind up as well. 
So now that we kind of have that, hopefully that made sense to folks. Um, and I, I have a note here in case you kind of forget. I'm just gonna go over this and you'll see, so, so this particular cell here in the Stupider Notebook, I'm not gonna run it because we're gonna run this um, from the command line actually, but I have set up this tag called parameters. And so this tag in this cell is gonna tell this paper mill um, library that I'm passing in parameters. Um, and I'm doing this because again, absolutely under no circumstances do you ever check in access keys or secret access keys to GitHub, right? So you have to be very diligent and, and conscientious. That's part of just best practices. Um, but there's a couple of other things that are configurable. So this Sage bucket, this is gonna be the Eagle View data bucket that I just showed you guys. This is where we want SageMaker to go. Um, my bucket is gonna be your team bucket. So this, is, this can be named whatever the heck you want. Um, I'll show you, I have a team bucket in here. So if we do, um, so we just got into Eagle View data. Let's see what's inside of Eagle View data. And I have team echidna, which is just myself. Um, and even further, if we go kind of into, and you can think of this again as um, just a typical uh, uh, path, the path um, string. You can see that I have three different data sets or three different um, sub buckets. So they're kind of, it's, save it for another time, but um, it's a weird, S3 calls everything buckets. Uh, they're not necessarily data directories, but um, you, can, you can totally think of them as being kind of just folders. So in train, um, in this training bucket, you will see that we're gonna stick our training data .rec file that we generated at the end of the last uh, notebook. And then we're gonna, in, in the validation one, it's the same thing. So there's just literally two files in both of these things. So validation rec, training .rec. Um, and then the output is what's automatically generated by SageMaker. So just to give you that, I also have, um, you can go into the console, and I think I'll have to slack you guys after this, um, the, uh, the login information. Um, but I just wanted to show you, you can uh, go to this, uh, just AWS console uh, online, and you can kind of navigate around. Um, if we go to, this is, if you've never been to AWS, uh, if you log into it, there's lots of services. There's a ton of different things that I've never touched in my life, and I don't know what they do. Um, but my core ones, S3, EC2 is the compute, so if you wanted to spin up a virtual machine um, and just kind of own that in a more of a persistent way, and then SageMaker. So if we go to S3, we should see, in this case, the same bucket that I just showed you on the command line. Um, so we see the bucket, equal to data, and we see my team. Um, and then we see the same exact thing. So if you generated this rec data that we did at the end of the, the uh, last notebook, you can totally just drag and drop it here. Or we, you can follow along in the, uh, um, the part two here of our notebook and it does it programmatically as well. Okay, so going back to this guy, any questions on that? Um, I think it's more or less straightforward. Um, all right, so the next thing is, we're gonna see a bunch of things called hyperparameters. So all of these things that I'm highlighting here, these are all highly configurable variables that you can feed into the neural network. Some of them do absolutely nothing. <laughs> Some of them are really useful. And a lot of what data scientists do is kind of this iteration and tweaking of hyperparameters. Um, for us, you know, in this case, we have one and only class. We have just buildings. So this one, you know, is not necessarily a major, I mean, it is a major hyperparameter, but it's not a confusing one. Um, epochs are basically the, the, the amount of times we're going to want to iterate through the statistical model. How many times do we want to try to update the weights? Are you raising your hand? No? Yes? Ooh, scoring. Okay. Um, in this one, we are only going to do twice. It takes a while. I'm going to warn you now, like, most uh, models, especially depending on the, kind of the, the duration of training, your fidelity, your loss function, you know, improves over many hundreds of epochs. It kind of depends on the amount of data. In this particular data set that I pre-baked for you guys that you pulled out from S3, it's small, it runs pretty quick, but it's gonna be kind of shitty in terms of results. Um, but I also didn't wanna spend hours training, so we just are gonna iterate through twice. And I think it takes about six minutes on my um, system Again, because it's agnostic to what's on your computer, we're gonna be running this machine in the cloud. Your, your timing should be exactly the same as mine. Um, this mini batch size is basically the amount of our data that we want to use with each iteration. So this is something now where we're getting into this realm of, 
you might want to use all of the data. I didn't really tell you, I think I literally only have 26 curated data samples, which is super small and ridiculous and embarrassing to admit to. Um, usually for a good uh, training data set, you need thousands, if not many more than that. Um, so this batch size is just like for each iteration, just use a couple. This again is just illustrative. You can, you can play around with this and I encourage you. LR is learning rate. This is kind of how fast we're gonna try to optimize and learn as we want to minimize this loss function um, that I have alluded to. And then there's this nice little uh, factor um, called the LR schedule, scheduler factor, which kind of allows you to kind of tweak the learning rate with time. Again, something that I typically leave as a default unless I you know, kind of want to play around with it. Momentum is kind of the speed with which, or the momentum, sorry, with which um, we're going to try to improve our learning rate. Um, again, these are all things that you're are welcome to, to Google. I don't want to spend too much time going into. Um, I typically leave momentum, weight decay, uh, oops, I had to have two more um, overlap, uh, and some of these other ones kind of default until I kind of get a feel, get everything running, and then I start playing around and sandboxing with things. Um, this non-maximal suppression threshold is something that allows, uh, especially from an object detection perspective, if you have a lot of overlapping detections, um, it's going to try to suppress some of the, the lower confidence ones. And so that confidence threshold is set at this 0.45. Our image shape, because we're using these slippy map tiles, are always 256. Um, label width is basically the biggest size of the bounding box that we kind of anticipate in pixels. I'm guessing at 150. I think like 150 is a pretty big number of pixels in this particular image shape. But again, this is something that you can play around with. Um, the number of training samples, I don't, it doesn't really matter what number this is as long as it's large. I think it's just kind of buffering the allocated memory for SageMaker. And the network that we're going to use as the backbone to this um, single shot detection is ResNet 50. Um, and again, this is kind of the, the framework for which we are, the recipe, the, our neural network recipe. And so the nice thing about SageMaker is there's a couple of different options you can use here, um, but it's all plug and play. You don't have to re recreate any of these. You don't have to program any of these. Um, so it allows you to kind of play around with things. And then we're using this idea of stochastic gradient descent um, to try to optimize um, our learning. So role is something, again, another, another parameter that we'll set through. I'm just gonna go through all of this as we kind of, um, before we kick it off with paper mill so that you have a sense of what's going on. Uh, and this guy, you know, we're gonna start, uh, this is where you're gonna shove all of the data that you hopefully generated. If you didn't generate it, you still have it because you, I made you guys download it. Um, but this allows you, this is just, we're gonna use Bodo3 to push the data to S3. Um, I think uh, here, this is where we're gonna pass, you'll see in a second, my bucket would be your unique team name. So mine was the team Echidna, you can make it whatever you want. Um, we create a SageMaker session and we're gonna download what they call a training image. So in this case, it's just, think of it as like a, uh, a, a Docker image. It's just kind of a pre-configured, um, uh, what they call like a, an AMI of, that already has all the dependencies associated with object detection. So again, something nice um, for you to just kind of get, get started. And it's just pulling the latest version. There's lots of other flavors here. I mean, SageMaker is pretty standard. You know, those examples that I showed you with classification, object detection, and semantic segmentation, they have kind of these Docker containers for each one of those. So you don't have to worry about it. You just tell it what you want. Um, once we obviously uploaded things, we're gonna just define what our training data is and what our validation data is and set, you know, the output in this case is just that output folder um, like I also showed you. And then, we only really have this last little bit. So the model with SageMaker, you have to kind of set up this estimator. Um, and this is kind of the cool part where, you know, we've already predefined a lot of this information. You don't need to worry too much about this, except we only want one machine. Um, and then this is the type of machine. And so this is kind of cool. If you're interested in cloud compute, you can Google AWS EC2 machine types. Um, and there's lots to pick from. In this case, we're using a GPU-based machine, which is a is p2.xl, um, but there's lots of different flavors. So they all come with different expense costs. So, and, and typically expenses on an hourly basis. So just something to keep in mind. Again, one of the beautiful things with SageMaker is that it's only live during your training. So you don't have to worry about 
shutting things down or turning things off or being, you know, accruing um, money that you don't, you didn't intend to spend. Um, and then some other things I typically just use uh, as defaults, so, you know, kind of the volume size of this particular machine, what kind of input, um, where to stick the output, and what the session is. So we define that session above. <laughs> And then we just have to pass through all those hyperparameters. So again, pretty much plug and play with everything else that we predefined. Um, and then uh, we kind of set up, make sure that SageMaker knows about our training data, our validation data, uh, and you know, creating a dictionary around that. And then literally it's just fit. So we're gonna call this fit function, just gonna send it off to the cloud. It's gonna run for a period of time. Um, and I think kind of a little bit of the unfortunate thing with paper mill is that it kind of hides some of that logging. So you're not going to necessarily see some of the parameters that it spits out, um, but you're definitely welcome to try to run this through the notebook um, with uh, some more time than you might have. All right. Um, and then the other thing I want to talk about before we kick this off is once you've trained a model, it'll just be complete and it'll go sit in S3 and you'll have this nice little zipped file called model.par.gz or something. Um, but you can use that to deploy an endpoint. And so this is where like, if from a data science perspective, if you just wanted to be able to hit a service with an image, so say like you have a new satellite image or a new tile, and you really wanna know what the buildings are, you can just feed it, you know, or send it to that, that service and get all the predictions back. So it's this really nice, you know, end-to-end -end situation that I think SageMaker does. Um, from a command line perspective, uh, you know, you can uncomment these. One of the things like if you, your first endpoints might fail, like they might not complete or they might, something might go bad, um, but you can kind of delete those pretty quickly. You can also delete the model as well. All right, so that's kind of in a nutshell, like a bunch of stuff. So I just wanted to kind of quickly in the last couple of minutes just show you kind of the, 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 the streamlined way of kicking this off. Um, so I have my little cheat thing over here. So in utils, I'm just gonna share with you what it looks like. Um, I created this dumb file that then I was very careful to put in the .git ignore. I'm assuming you guys talked about .git ignores. But .git ignores are files that if you upload your data to, to GitHub, it will ignore anything that you put in there. So this execute um, part two um, is basically, it has a bunch of sensitive information in it, so I don't want that. Um, on GitHub, but it's just a two-liner thing. So we're going to import paper mill. We're going to execute this notebook. So you'll see the notebook name. Um, you give it kind of an output. It generates an output notebook. Um, it just has all that data as part of, of what you pass. And then you send it a dictionary. So in our case, is we're going to want to send it, you know, the Sage bucket will stay the same for everybody. Your bucket is whatever your team is. Um, and it should create, if it doesn't, you might have to just create it. Uh, you can either you know, do that on the command line and I can, I can show you guys how to do that offline um, or you can do that on the website. And then your role is gonna stay the same as my role um, and that I've already sent you guys. The access key and the secret key are also the same. So I'm just gonna copy and paste this into, um, into Slack so you have this. So that's what my, literally what my execution script looks like. And so then to just execute, it's really nice. I mean, it should be, hopefully, fingers crossed, utils um, or Python utils and then execute. And then you know, we're gonna probably have to leave this running. It gives you a percent status complete. It hangs a little while as it's like uploading data to S3 and it's configuring things and um, uh, trying to orchestrate some of the resources. But at the end of this, when it hits that 100% uh, complete or I guess 14 out of 14 parts, you'll have a model. And so the last piece, because you know, I'm a little worried we might run out of time and I wanna make sure there's a little bit of time of questions, um, you can just run the test. Uh, so there's another test file that I can show you here as well. So once that gets done, um, let's see if I saw it again. So like I mentioned before, um, you could just do another bash script with this test and it has another, it basically is gonna take everything that we put in the tiles bucket in that repo, send it to your endpoint, um, which I'll show you how to get in a second. It's 
gonna look for buildings. Um, this is the, the data that it's gonna use. We're gonna pass it a role, pass it the, the same access key and secret key. And then we also wanna pass it a threshold detection. So this is something where we, you know, if you only want detections that are really confident, you would you know, put it closer to one. If you want everything, you put it closer to zero. Um, and so uh, just to give you, again, this baked cake I was gonna show you, once you run that test.ash, um, this is what it looks like, if I can find my, <clears throat> I put my output, um, that last, the test.sh will generate a script of predictions. So I have my test output trashy.geojson, that was the, all the predictions. And it's actually kind of, it's kind of crappy. <laughs> There's some weird artifacts, which I haven't quite figured out. So these I think are, you know, again, small, but the good news is that you can see, it looks, sorry, it keeps doing that. Um, you see things that start to look not unreasonable for building locations. We won't really know until we pull this into like either using Folium or QGIS and put it on top of the raster data. We won't necessarily be able to tell yet if those are true buildings. Um, but it's kind of cool to just see the output predictions. And again, it's about as crappy as I thought it would be just given the a little amount of time that was spent on it. Um, but that was, I mean, that was huge. We have like four minutes left and I still feel slightly apologetic for giving you so much, but I hope that there were some elements there that you might be able to dig back in at your own time. I'm around for a little bit to talk about. Um, but, you know, again, just providing you with some tool sets that you can use in an applied sense to try to, um, you know, think about how your applications might be utilized in this way. So thank you for your time and attention. And I will open it for questions. And if not, I'm here for a period of time. So.